because we are performance-based athletes, the stuff that you do in the gym, although it needs to have a lot of variability, it doesn't have to continue to get harder and harder and harder. The stuff that you, you can find four workouts that really work well, it, do, it means those four workouts are good. You know, stick with them and rotate through them um, over and over and over again. You could do that for years. And, and, it would, and if it's working, you might not need more. So I, I have a volume one in-season program. I have a volume two. There'll probably be a volume three. But that's going to be good enough. If, if I have people that have been working in volume one for two years, and they feel great. They don't, and they keep calling me, and they're like, Aaron, I think I should do volume two. two. And I'm like, well, there are some cool things about volume two. But if you feel great, don't mess with great. You're, you're doing well. Your coach is getting you stronger and faster, and I'm keeping you healthy. That was Aaron Carson, and this is the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. Welcome to episode 114 of the YTP. I'm Jess, your host, and today we've got a super informative convo with Aaron Carson, who is literally the strength guru to the endurance stars. She works with the likes of Flora Duffy, Timothy O'Donnell, and Marinda Carfrey to keep their bodies in top form so that they can continue to excel even from the top. If you know anything about the endurance scene in Boulder, Colorado, then you know of Erin. She is the owner and managing partner of the iconic Raleigh Sport Club, which has been around for almost 40 years. And within that club, she runs EC Fit Boulder. She maintains a sports-specific approach to strength training designed to support and complement high-volume endurance athletes. She considers herself a traditional strength coach in that she believes in loading the body with heavy weight, but she holds a focus on the core elements of functional movement, and she will absolutely not load an athlete that is not stable or durable. She works with each individual as an individual. She considers their background in sport, their posture, their mobility, their stress levels, their happiness factor, and of course, their goals. She incorporates lots of play into her approach, even though it freaks her athletes out. She knows very well that stronger doesn't always equal better performance, so she is constantly assessing the risk and reward of strengthening an athlete body. She herself is a competitive age group triathlete and is no stranger to the podium, and She's just an all-around super cool human. We caught up with Aaron last month just before Ironman Boulder and definitely don't skip the outro of this podcast because Aaron has hooked up the YT community with something very cool. Before we jump in, I want to welcome two new athletes to Team Yogi Triathlete in our first Power Couple edition. Tina and George come to us from Ohio, and they both have athletic backgrounds that have fallen into the background, so they are super motivated and fired up to reclaim their fitness. Tina came into our lives last November when she joined the M21 Revolution on a whim, thinking, hey, what do I have to lose? Well, I'm so fired up to say that she's lost just about everything that she doesn't need anymore, and she is stepping into a power that has always been lingering behind the curtain of her life. From adding meditation and mindful living practices through the M21 revolution to transitioning her life to being plant-based to signing up with the team. We are filled with excitement that they have chosen Yogi Triathlete to step up their power in life. So welcome you two. We are joy filled to have you on our team of badass athletes. We are an international team and we are taking on new team members. So get over here. It's time to step it up. All right, here we go. Another killer convo with a super cool powerhouse coach and fellow triathlete, Aaron Carson. We realize that there's no walls or borders, that we can reach people all over the world. And right. you're really realizing that after, so how long have you been here at Rally? Like, Rally is your club. We lived here in the early <laughs> 2000s and Rally was here. You've been here for a long time. The club's been here 40 years or just a little short of it. And I've been here 27 years. And I've been one of the owners uh, for six years. So it's been a journey. And I'm the managing partner, and it, it essentially is its my gig. But I have very generous and wonderful investors and 
That's we're amazing. rocking it. Yeah. And so for a long time, this club was just reaching people in the local vicinity. But recently, you've realized that we don't have to have these walls and borders and that you're reaching people now wherever they live across the globe through your app. It's kind of mind-blowing. It's, it's really, really cool. It's really cool because the stuff that we're doing isn't, it isn't the... Um, it isn't traditional strength training stuff in that you can just go find it in a textbook. You know, a lot of the professional athletes that we work with and we have access to, and I think that's where we are just very blessed and very lucky, is that we're in this mecca of endurance athletes and endurance sports. And any time you try to get a professional athlete or an elite athlete to try something new, they will be hesitant because they're already at the top of the triangle. So if you make that triangle, their performance is very, very, very good. It's world class. And if you say, well, let's try this, they have to be so careful not to mess up their magic. And so it takes time to build that trust and build those relationships because there's not a lot of research based on endurance athletes and strength training in particular. I mean, there's a lot of, in, there's a lot of research on swim, bike, run or running and threshold and lactate threshold and that kind of stuff. And I think we have to acknowledge that people are not machines and data like that can only go so far. So it became my mission six years ago when I started working with Timothy O'Donnell um, Tim knew that I was doing different things with athletes. He has been a very healthy athlete. And he sat down with me and we started talking a little bit on a referral from a mutual friend about the approach that I would take with an endurance athlete. And I have a, a tried and true rule that so far has been serving me very well, which is I will put I'm a very traditional strength coach in that I really believe in Olympic lifting. I really believe in heavy load. I believe in the hormonal response from loading um, anybody with, with, uh, with heavy weights. But I also have that rule that I will not add external load to a structure that is not mobile and healthy and stable. And so with Tim in particular, because he was my first professional kind of name that you might recognize, um, we recognize that he was a swimmer. So he grew up without this gravity-based structure. So we had to get his posture long and strong. He's very long in his torso. He's very long in his arms. And he's obviously beautifully talented and gifted as an endurance athlete. But when it came to making him stronger so that he could get faster, um, it took us almost a year to put him under significant load. And then three weeks after I started training with Tim, um, Rini was piqued as far as her interest in what we were doing and how he was feeling. And she came and we sat down and we devised a plan for her. And her background is way different than Tim's. So her programming was way different than Tim's and the pace of her um, loading strategies was different than Tim's. And she grew up as a basketball player. So she actually is one of the very few athletes that I've ever coached who back squats. Um, she's actually the only person I have right now that I, that I coach who puts a bar on her back. Everybody else front squats or goblet squats or we use weight vests. And there's all these different strategies for external load. So why do you – why – what does she have – I mean, we know she's got something, but she's, what does she have? What does it allow us her to do that? Is it based on her background as a basketball player? It based on the fact that she's been back squatting her whole life. So she has exceptional posture. And she is obviously in that bell curve of athletes. She is an outlier um, for performance. So more often than not, nine out of 10 people who spend a significant time on their bicycle will have very bad posture and forward head and we need to get their thoracic spine mobile. Um, and then we really have to assess whether or not it's safe and effective for them to put the bar on their back, whether it be for a lunge or whether it be for a, a squat. So she just has that exceptional posture and that ability 
to get into that position really, really well. Mm -hmm. And so it is one of the most effective exercises out there as far as athletic performance. But with every reward, there comes a risk. And you're constantly assessing risk and reward when you're you have this huge daunting responsibility of working with these guys because I think my first thing, my first feeling uh, around working with these athletes was, was absolute fear. Like don't screw it up, (laughs) you know? So, so I think that's a healthy emotion going into it, just a daunting respect for the work that they've done their whole life and how talented they are and, and that kind of stuff. And then, and then to look at them each as individuals. And although there's a very systematic philosophical foundation to what I do, um, everybody's different. And every athlete needs to be treated just a little bit differently. I can't tell you how much we agree with that. And I've, I've said it so many times. We're not templates. Right. We're not templates. So we have different backgrounds. We have different um, relationships to stress in our life, which greatly affects our ability to heal. You know, where you know where are we functioning in that in that nervous system, and to listen, to sit down with Tim and listen and watch and see and you know coming into this, you know I can I can when I w- lived here as a massage therapist and I worked with some of these Ironman you know champions and things like that and it was like. <gasps> I don't want to screw anything up. But then you realize, like, this is just communication and this is a partnership and what's working and what's not working. And I think relieving that pressure of, like, okay, I don't I don't know anything, but I, I don't know everything, but I know enough to sit down and connect with you and watch and follow my intuition and the experience that I have and see, you know, be willing to let go of what doesn't work and, you know, watch what does work exactly. and what else can we – how can we let that grow? But the fear thing is interesting because the fear thing is, I think, a reason why a lot of people would shy away from doing what, you know, they're called to do. So, you know, when Tim walks in and you're like, oh, my God, this is the first, the big, the like the first, and now, now Rinny. And how, how are you, what's your relationship to that fear? What keeps you going forward? Well, now the fear has kind of turned into wisdom, a little bit of experience and stories. Everybody has a story. So you know, now there's a belief system that's based on success. There's a belief system based on longevity. And although our focus is always to win championships and stay healthy, um, not necessarily in that order, uh, my vision for all of my athletes has always been to elongate their career because I'm a golf fan as well, and I watched these weekend golf tournaments on the PGA Tour, the guy that comes 40th makes more money than the winner of Kona. And that, to me, is, A, it's wrong, because I know that it's way more painful to race than it is to play golf physically. Mentally, you might get beat up a little bit harder, but I'm sure there's lots of triathletes that would... uh, would beg to differ on that point as well. But I know that their ability to earn as professional athletes in the endurance world is much more challenging. And so therefore, you know, we need to make sure that when they get to be 25 or like a a Sam Long who's in his early 20s, you know, we take care of him so that he can race like Craig Alexander until he's 42 or 43. And if we can elongate, let's just talk about Tim and Rini because they're kind of the names that people really recognize, you know, they're in their... Uh, mid 30s now like 36 37 Rennie just had a baby you know so that's going to be a different structure for her as we go through these yeah, next everything five or has six been years recalibrated in her personal life right and she's they're so happy and I think happy is very fast so I'm really confident about this weekend fingers crossed in cans but I I know that Tim um you know Craig Alexander seems to be the one that is defying the odds. And, and Craig, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him physically a little bit when he comes to Boulder, and that's been just an honor to be, to be part of his journey a little bit. But he's setting the standard that we can help these athletes race well and win in their 40s. And I think we're going to see that, and I'm hoping to be part of that with T.O. Um, I know the desire will still be there when these young guns are coming up and they're fast and they're strong and um, you know, we get to watch Javi Gomez do his first Ironman this weekend, which will be interesting because uh, he's a beast. But he physically is just so strong. So I think setting the stage that that the strength component 
is a really important component to swim, bike, run. I think we're going to see that. That's and it's not critical. just for, so we're talking the aging athlete, right? Cause yeah. Timmy, um, myself, like, w- w- and, and as an age group, I'm always thinking about like how I can get stronger, but it seems like Sam Long, he's in the twenties, right? So yep. getting it early enough so that they understand, the, understand, do all the research and get all this stuff out of the way first so they understand what's working for them and then they can carry it out. They'll probably change. Yep. Most likely change. Bodies change, minds change, you know, stresses change. But as an age grouper, so do you work with age groupers as well? Because I'm, sh- I'm assuming and I'm yeah. talking from my angle, like I see the video. I see like t- Tim getting stronger. I yep. see Rennie getting stronger. I see uh, Crowe. Um, and, I, and there's not much deterioration in their form or body and all that. And I know age groupers just, they cling on to that stuff. They like, they like this because that's, those are the stories that, that add the credibility to us as age groupers. I work with a lot of age groupers and they intrigue me in so many ways because we were talking a little bit about that full life stress. Stress is stress, whether we're, you know, our dogs get cancer and we have to deal with that or we're having a, you know, spat with our, our spouse or something or just just work and just cumulative load. You know, it, it, it isn't all about deadlifting and it isn't all about squatting. And actually, that just creeps me out to see so many articles about that we all need to be doing that because we don't. Sometimes we just need to move. We need to move well, which is why I started um teaching and became certified and aligned with a group uh, with foundation training. Mm-hmm. And it's, I, I do not have the personality of a yoga person. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I definitely, At least you know that. I know <laughs> it. I, I don't even, yeah, I don't have that personality or that drive and I truly respect it. But I also know how much yoga in general, we want to come down. We need to nurture that parasympathetic, that rest and digest. Um, and I wanted a tool that I could use that I thought would be more appropriate for an endurance athlete. Because I think sometimes yoga and stretching can actually make you slower and less healthy um, in our structure as, as an endurance athlete. And I'm not saying that blanket wise, but there's definitely some things that are not not appropriate. Well, I think when you don't have the information about your own body, and I see it with athletes in my classes, that they're overstretching what's already overstretched and through the, you know, not understanding that forward head posture also equals kyphosis, you know, right. that, right, that there's this amazing inherent wisdom in the body that works in a cross pattern. And it's always like recruiting. So that if one thing is off, your body's going to say, oh, okay, I'll do this. And it will do that for so long until red flags start to come up. So I think body awareness is so big and understanding foundation in your own body and how I always call, like when I'm teaching a yoga class, I talk about our skeleton as our scaffolding. And I'll ask them to like notice how their scaffolding is. And if it was scaffolding on the side of a building, would you climb up it? And that's where I think that you guys as leaders in, in many ways – But as specifically buying into the yoga journey, I think people, when they enter into an experience like that or a class, make sure that the instructor understands the scaffolding. Yes, yes. See, my background's in ortho sports massage, so I studied the body for, you know, and I went to college, I went to massage college here at BCMT, and so, you know, it was like, you Those had were to... such good days, by the way. I'm so I sad know, that that is gone. I know, We used to do the boulder, boulder massage and you everything. You guys were just spectacular, and so many great people came out but of that But just school. being trained, you know, to to work and assist with the best of the best. Like you had to be the best of the best or you weren't going to last in this town as, as somebody that was working with bodies. So in being an athlete and being, you know, a kind of an overachiever from the start, it was like, I want to be, I want to be that, you know, I want to work with the debooms. I want right. to, you know, back then I want to, I want to assist these people. I want to be part of that greatness, you know? And so I learned a lot about that and you just see the, the posture. And so with, and I love what, like your philosophy, it's just if we're loading, an, if we're You don't a, want to load dysfunction. Yeah, if we're putting on a weighted backpack and we're climbing up the scaffolding on the side of a building that's swaying from side to side right. in the wind, like, does that seem like a smart idea? No. Right. That's so I think it's idea. important to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. Whether it's with a strength coach or whether it's with anybody. So I... The scaffolding, the structure, the stability in the right places. I, I've been working with a lot of runners lately. And it's a lot easier for me to work with runners because they don't ride bikes. 
It is so much. The bike is like a the whole. The bike. bike does a whole different situation. That anterior tilt of the pelvis, the dropping, you know, the, the, and the, the upper back and the, yeah, it's, it, we have to un, unwind those triathletes so much more than unwinding the runners. So what are you unwinding in runners? What do runners have? Uh, runners, it's, it's very similar, but they don't have the biggest anterior tilt. So they're not on their bicycle, so their pelvis is just a little bit more towards neutral. It's easier for me to get them unloading those hamstrings. So we were talking about stretching what's already long. If you look at an an when your hips drop to the front, the anterior tilt of that pelvis, it immediately puts your hamstrings on a stretch. And we hear so many people, I mean, everybody raise your hand who thinks they have a high hamstring issue or a that tendinopathy or tendinosis in a hamstring. And I've talked to so many people who, who have those, and I think it's because they get off their bikes, they're in the big anterior tilt. The, it feels like they need to stretch their hamstrings, but they really need to unload and reposition the pelvis a little bit more. So the runners come in just, they're a little more fatigued, they're a little bit more, they can break in, in mm. different ways, but if we can get them just stronger in their posterior chains and just get them more upright, they're pretty, pretty happy. So let's go back to the hamstring thing, because when you've got that anterior pelvic tilt, you've also got the adaptively shortened in the low back. Yep. Right? And then you've got, correct me if I'm wrong, psoas. What's going on with the psoas? Are you and I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. I, I know that the psoas takes the blame a mm -hmm. lot. Ooh, I like this. And the psoas connects to the pelvis via the iliacus. Mm. But we never blame the iliacus. No, because we always forget about it. It's like this little thing that ends up forming that common tendon. And we also don't blame rectus femoris, mm -hmm. which also crosses the hip. Mm -hmm. So we started in, in with some of my mentors, and, and I, you know, I'm definitely learning from these people. We started talking about anterior capsule. Mm -hmm. So we're going to blame everybody. And I also think that, and this is where I could be a yoga instructor, I think that when you blame the psoas, he fights back a little bit. Well, it's negative energy. We're giving him negative energy. Yeah. So I, I say we alleviate it a little bit. What we focus on expands. Word. So right? I, I stopped <laughs> blaming him for everything. I like that. <laughs> you are so, a yogi girl. Yeah, maybe I'm just thinking. So I, you know, there's <laughs> never anything wrong. There's just maybe some things that we can make optimize a little bit well words are really important and yeah so I, I think that that leads to something i wanted to talk about is the stories that people have about the bad shoulder yep the, the bad, bad knee i'm bone on bone i can't, ha can't tell run. you how many times i've heard on bone on bone yep um what's your relationship to the stories and, and how do you how do you assist people in maybe unraveling those stories a little bit? So the two key mentors that I have for those stories, because every, we all learn from everybody. So I don't want to portray that, that I invented anything because I'm just a sponge when it comes to learning. And the two key people that immediately come to my mind are Gray Cook, who's a physical therapist, super smart guy who talks a lot about mobility in the ankles, the hips, and the thoracic spine three key areas of mobility the body stacks up like in layers so if we even let's start at the bottom of the foot the plantar fascia because raise your hand if you've had a little plantar fasciitis just a little bit right and we love to blame the foot for that and i i would gander that it's not always the foot right it could be but i doubt it <laughs> so the bottom of the foot and that plantar fascia should be stable the ankle should be mobile so that the knee can be stable if the hips can be mobile, then the low back can be stable and do his job and be unloaded. If the thoracic spine is mobile, then the neck can be stable. So if we look at that TT position, and we, we have people who have low back pain, and we talk about that lordotic curve and the excessive because of the anterior tilt, I wouldn't go after the low back at all. I would mobilize the hips and the thoracic spine. So I'm always going to look above it and below it. And I have, I have a couple of Olympians that I train who think they're bone on bone on their knees. Well, if we mobilize their ankles and we mobilize their hips, their knees become less loaded and their knees become, the ask of the knees becomes less. So I, I can't even tell you the last time that I worked on someone's knees. I just try to unload the tension that might come there. 
So when we talk about tension, that's where the next mentor kind of comes in, and that's Thomas Myers, who's a structural integration guy, and you're yeah, nodding because you know, yeah, I know, you know that who name. he is. Mm-hmm. So we started talking about the fascial system, and we started talking about um, the mystery and the beauty and the intrigue of fascia because anybody that says they understand it, um, I would I would challenge them in so many ways because we don't nobody really understands it yet. Like we can even have a conversation about the way that the National Academy of Sports Medicine portrays foam rolling and why foam rolling works or doesn't work. And most people don't know why it works. We just know that it works. It helps. Do you feel better? Yes. Okay. We don't know why, but we're pretty sure something happened between the nervous system and the fascial system that let some release happen. So is it is it um, adhesions? We're not sure. Is it is it dysfunction? We're not sure. I mean, people that people that are still foam rolling their IT bands, thinking they're releasing their IT bands. This is our public service announcement to you. You are not releasing your IT band. <laughs> Let's get your hips working a little bit better and try and unload your IT band by lighting up the muscles that are need to do those jobs, which to me would be the glute med and maybe a little bit of VMO. So what are some of the things that you're doing for mobilization of this? Is this is this hands-on work? Is this is I, body movement? I will do some hands-on work. It's definitely not my forte, and there's definitely people that are way better at it than me. Um, there's tons of massage therapists and body workers who understand movement really, really well. Um, there's no doubt that if an athlete comes in, and, and the first thing that I look at is how are their feet and ankles moving. Most of In, in most of the videos and on the, um, the app, most of the athletes in the videos are barefoot. So it's really easy to see for me whether or not their feet are working well. And even socks. So some people, you know, I'll, I'll challenge you that your hands are way dirtier than your feet. So this thing, thinking that you shouldn't be training barefoot um, because of the filth of the ground <laughs> is probably an unfair assumption. So we train barefoot and I want to see the feet spread out and I want to see the toes have a job and do their job and not necessarily grip the ground or anything, but I want to see a relaxed foot and a a solid foot. And if they're in shoes, I can't always see that. So I'm going to look at their ankles and make sure they're, they're moving well. And I use a lot of wobble board. I use the body as a driver to move the ankle in rotation. Um, I will actually put my thumb anterior specifically, and I might pull on the heel a little bit to just create some space in the joint. Um, so I'll do a little bit of ma- manual ma- manipulation, but it's definitely not in my wheelhouse or, or my huge area of interest, but I can do it and I understand a little bit about it. So um, the next thing is obviously to get into the hips. And it's, if you can get somebody's hips open, they just say thank you. So especially most of my stuff with athletes works really well if they have good coaches who believe in progressive overload. So as a strength coach uh, for endurance athletes, I encourage you, if you do have that opportunity to work with endurance athletes, let go of your ego um, because you don't get to be the one to progressively overload these athletes. I promise you that uh, Julie Dibbins and Neil Henderson and Siri Lindley don't trust me with their athletes um, because I inhibit their ability to do their training sessions. So... If I could, if I, I know I could make Rini stronger physically, but making her stronger physically wouldn't necessarily make her a better triathlete. So that's a huge concept that strength coaches need to recognize. The only thing that matters is that athlete is progressing in the sport that they want to perform well in. And you're keeping them um, with this foundation. Uh, which is a recipe for longevity. A hundred percent. So when Julie gives Tim O'Donnell his workouts, and last week his efforts were at 370 or 380 watts, my job is to make sure that his body is ready to go 390. But that's Julie's job to get him to go 390. And it's his job to go 390. I'm in charge of making sure that tissue and the joint and the posture is ready to accept that challenge and not break under that stress. I don't, you know, that's where I, I, it scares the crap out of me. I mean, a lot of times I'm reading magazines and they're showing pictures of, of endurance athletes doing straight bar deadlift. Again, big reward, huge risk. 
if you blow out a disc of, of an endurance athlete and they don't get to ride their bike or go for a run for a year potentially, like that's horrible. So we step back from that straight bar deadlift. I don't straight bar deadlift any, 100%. No one straight bar deadlifts. But we hex bar deadlift because that goes through your skeleton and that's your structure, your scaffolding, not this, this very hard angle of, mm-hmm. of levers that, that can do can have big pluses but meet many triathletes who have sacroiliac joints issues my SI joint is locked up well we're locked up a lot because we're asking our pelvis to sit in one position on the bike and then we're asking it to move when we run so most people have SI joint dysfunction a little bit so then we go and load that with a straight bar deadlift and it's a recipe for disaster I I it feels like we're just getting so much wiser about about meeting the meeting the body where it's at and getting really wise about how can we support the body and the, and the structure of the body the best so that the muscles that are hanging from it can be optimal beautifully said. for the sport of that athlete yeah cuz if you take if you take three buckets we have one bucket that's for health and then we have one bucket that's for fitness. And then we have another bucket for performance. And I think I get really jazzed about health and performance. But I think we could all agree, and that's one of those things that you have to ask yourself, are the fastest people the healthiest people? We could probably question that on some levels, right? Mm-hmm. Because health to me is about relationships. It's about rest and sleep it's and having yeah. sex. I mean, we could have a whole nother podcast. I hope you guys have that one <laughs> because endurance athletes need to talk about that. That's the but second time we've talked about sex yeah. today. Was it Nicole that was talking was about it? Of course it was Nicole. See, because that's healthy, but we need to remember that. So the fittest That's people... That's going to get the pelvis moving, too. Word. Especially... <laughs> well, we can talk about that. That's a whole other episode. But, but healthy people is, you know, there's, there's the full structure of their life happening. If you're at the t- peak of your sport, chances are you've got some deficits in your health bucket. It doesn't mean you can't get them back, but you're giving things up. You're giving up social interaction. You're giving up a lot you're giving up uh, some good sleep. You're giving up travel. You're giving up some friends because you're going to perform well. The fitness side of things is really an interesting one for me that even my 82-year-old guys, I try to get them to think that, that I train. I try to get them to think about a performance goal because fitness is so confusing for me now with CrossFit and, you know, Tough Mudders and all of these Spartan, races, Spartan yeah. racing, which I think people are loving Right now, you know, and I think loving things is very healthy. So I I don't know. Fitness is confusing. Like, it's just like I there's a studio in Boulder here that does high intensity Pilates. Like, what are we talking about? It's kind of like Like, it's like nutrition now. Like, how are you eating? What is your label around? What are you a CrossFitter? Are you a high intensity Pilates person? Are you a vegan? Are you paleo? paleo Are you high yeah. carb, low carb? And it's like jeans. No like, carb. I remember yeah. when I could go to the Gap and just get a pair of jeans. Now it's like low ride, zip yeah. fly, low ride, Oh, low so confusing. Thin thigh, big thigh. Like I'm like Jesus. I just want a pair of boots. Right. Or, I mean, or a pair of jeans. <laughs> jeans. I guess I need a pair of boots. That might so be subliminal. So I just kind of really like to focus on on performance and and is it working? And can we have that conversation? You know. So my 82 year old guy, like you skied three times a week for the entire season, we win your program is, is on hit, you know, um, the, the training, we all as athletes have that point, And hopefully you're at that point today because you have a big race coming up this weekend where, you know, the training was good. You had a good block. So no matter what happens on, tra- on race day, you're, you're, you know, you had a successful journey up to the race day. Cause we, anything can happen for us, right. On the race day. Absolutely. And so, if you can detach from that, then it truly becomes about the journey, right? It yeah. truly becomes, everybody talks about that, but it truly becomes that whole lead up. And if, yeah, if you can be okay with it and whatever happens on race day, it's going to happen. Just, yeah. It's a, it's celebration day, right? Word. It's the, it's the day to get out there and just use your fitness. Now that's not to say weather, all these other factors, which you have yeah. no control over. Right. And you're wasting energy sending it out there 
You just have you just sit with yourself and yeah. have confidence that you've done everything you can. I know. For the body and that's, the situation you're in. And that's healthy, right? That's healthy. So even I know, um, if you look at the pictures of Tim and Rini right now, that this this peacefulness that comes through them and this joy of their their family, the way it's together now with Izzy. And you see, yesterday I was on Instagram and I see a picture of them at the zoo. I'm like, you're at the Asia Pacific Oceania Championship for Ironman. And they went to the zoo. And Rini's hugging a, a koala bear and Tio's got Izzy and... There's this peacefulness that that makes me really content that they're in a really good place to toe the line on Saturday afternoon in North America, which is Sunday morning in Australia. And, you know, so then the race has to play out and hopefully things go well. But we're we're arriving at this race and this start in a really good place. Well, and I think that when you're high level like that, that one of the reasons you stay there is your ability to be, to be moldable with what's happening. That it's not, we never, you know, we can't go to the zoo because we have to be back in the thing. We have to get our legs up. And, but they're being moldable with this new dynamic that they have in their life. And the other thing is that it's all fueled by love. Right. Word. So, I love it. Yes. So it's there's we were talking about like, let's not blame the psoas anymore. It's not negative. Let's stop because it will fight back. Right. Whatever whatever we focus on expands. And so they're focusing on joy and and love. And so they're at the zoo and they're not they're not like, oh, we should be home. You know, they're right there in that moment. And I think that high level performance, whether whatever that is, whether you're a high level performing stay at home mom or a high level performing CEO, it's your ability to kind of be mobile, mobile and mobile really like yeah. with, with the shifts of life because everything is always changing and our bodies are always changing. And, you know, I think we're either progressing or we're, we're regressing. And so some people may look at that and be like, oh, they have a baby now. You know, that might throw a wrench in it, but I think they're progressing Me because too. of that baby. Me too. And I don't know them personally, but yeah. I, I see them. You know, I like other people watch their little show and stuff, and I see their, like, their their network is tighter. I it's think it's solid. strong. I think it's a good thing. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a baby to be strong, but I think it is, it's just finding that peacefulness and that love. And I think it was, was it Pete Jacobs in the Iron Man when he won and he was just mind blown because he won? And he just kept saying, I just kept saying love. My mantra on that day was just love. And he just kept running and he was so rhythmic and it was just, it was an epic performance. And it was, he was just, all he kept saying was that four letter word. And I think that's so powerful. Well, it's very powerful because from the yogi perspective, that is our, our essence is love, right? And love is ever powerful. And if, if he's out there, like that's his mantra, then he's calling out to his true self. And when you're calling out to your true self, you're calling out to a limitless a limitless, powerful source of energy. Word. I, I like love that. that. Yep. New mantra for Sunday? I'm thinking that, yeah. <laughs> Bolts are coming off. And love. <laughs> love and I know. <laughs> Our meditation teacher told BJ, he's like, that, it's time. You got to blow those bolts out. You got to just let them blow out, right? Can Sometimes we, you got to let it rot, like, just, just go. He said, yeah. He said, break the sound barrier slowly. Oh, I like that. Cool. I like that. And that's where <laughs> that's where that intrigue of that whole mindset of the yoga lifestyle became really attractive. But I knew that it, I, it, it wasn't my shtick and that there were experts. <laughs> I knew there were experts. <laughs> I don't know if we're experts, but, yeah. we're, but we're definitely discovering Well, that. what is an expert? But, exactly. exactly. You, know? you know what? I think, yeah. an ex well, first of all, an expert, like, if you're really like, oh, I'm an expert, then you're the person that stopped learning. But if you're the expert like you and the expert like me and the expert like BJ, we're sponges. Right. We never stop learning. We're experts at learning. Always we're experts of absorbing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have become an expert of being able to say, like, I don't know all the answers, but I will look for them. Yep. And, and I, will, I will do my darndest to find them and to assist you in the best way that I can. I think that I think that just in life, no matter what we're doing, like you said, whether you're the super mom or the, the just owning a health club, trying to do the best you can. And I think that if we all come from that place of we're just doing the best we can and we all cut each other maybe a little bit more slack. And see that in other people. Because even yeah. if somebody is, you know, 
let's just go to the, the darkness, like just strung out on drugs and everything. I honestly believe in that moment because of all that just density and toxicity, that is actually the best they can do. I really believe that no matter what it looks like, yep. it's the best that anybody can do. And, you know, I, once I started to see that in other people, it was easier for me to accept it within myself. Like, hey, wait a minute. Everybody, we're all just kind of doing the best we can. Whether or not on paper, if I was to write down what I think the best that somebody could do for that particular person, whether that matched up, that doesn't matter because that's my perspective. Their perspective is totally different. And that's what makes us individuals. Especially we, in as we are in this life, this try life that mm-hmm. kind of, um, where we have all met and where we have created our community. Um, yeah, that we all come in different layers of evolution and what's important. Sometimes that scares me a little bit for some people that they completely define themselves by swim, bike, run. Yeah. You know? It's and really sometimes limiting. it's just the conversation you had in the pool. That's more important than what happened in the pool. Like you, if you had a crappy training day, it's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, or you can't nail every session no. even as much as you want, and no, and no matter what the watch says, it yep. could have been, you could have hit all your times, but it could have just been junk, right? Like total junk. If you don't pull something from it, and there's a, I think there's a, a, co- a coach for everybody, right? Perspective. So things are gonna got, are gonna click together, and so for some people, that's just buying that plan for fifty dollars, you know, for a sixteen week Ironman, and that's what they're gonna do, and and that's right for them. That's the that's their best, you know. That's what's aligned with them. Yeah. So for somebody, like we've seen it, people think that they're ready to work with us, and they're just not ready to work with us. They're not they're not ready to put the work in, you know. Um, and so then they find what is aligned with them. At least you ask. Right. <laughs> you know? Because how many people get themselves into something and they don't even know what they're getting themselves yeah. into? And they're just reading. They're just going to the yeah. next workout. <laughs> next workout. Next, that, okay, I did bad at that one, but I'm still going to go do the next one. And right. It's like, that's when the coach can step in and say, whoa, let's reassess here and step back. And now we need to figure out what's going on, whether it's the strength or whether it's your mind or your home life. Or like you just your lease is up and you don't have a place to live next week. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, it's We've just... We've heard it all. I've got some pros that could tell you that story. <laughs> I'm living out of my van. <laughs> I know. But they, and they wait at the cafe for when we say, okay, these bagels are now free. <laughs> they're three days old and they're like, I'm a professional triathlete. Can I have... I'll take it. I'll take two. <laughs> so, I mean, I've, we've been here a long time and Boulder's just epic for those kinds of stories and <laughs> and then before you know it you know they're winning a few races and yep. this weekend was really fun at uh, at Alcatraz um, because we had two out of the top three guys on the podium with Cam Dye and Jason West and they're both at different points in their career you know Cam is just he's become a legend Talk he's about longevity. so amazing anything, like yeah. any and him and Neil Henderson I give Neil a huge shout, shout out because they have done such beautiful work together and they just keep going. And Jason is just this young, hungry, up and coming guy who's winning races. And, you know, he's, it's, what are we, one year out of the Olympics. So, you know, Jason's going to really hopefully play a role in the, the chase for Tokyo. And I know that that's his goal and that's really an exciting thing. So yeah, to be part of it with these guys and, and watch them come through. Cause Jason w- isn't waiting for the bagels, but he was pretty close a few months ago. <laughs> so, so winning a few races and all of a sudden it's like, no, I'm okay. I, I can actually have some scrambled eggs. He was good. battling with Eric and Matt. Yeah. Eric Lagerstrom, who's yeah. local yeah. to us yep. in, We've been, yeah. in Carlsbad. And he's that, that kid is, he's, that guy is just an old soul. Like Eric? he's got, yeah, he's got yeah. some wisdom. He's really, really interesting dude. But those three have kind of been battling, Shifting and then and forth. you know Eric took St. Anthony's, and who was it that won? Cam Dye uh, and Jason yeah. West when that race. All three of them. And they, then Huntington. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's been so exciting. What do you think about what ITU is doing to the sport, like long course? Oh, well, in. that's an exciting conversation, it I is think. Ex- I think it's super exciting. You know, it's so fun to be part of this evolution of sport because they're coming in and just making everything faster. It's crazy. You know, the, the thing that makes me excited is I'm in charge of taking care of bodies so they don't break. You know, so a lot of the, the, iron, the days of the Ironman champions coming down and being an automatic for a 70.3 win are gone. You know, because now 70.3 is a legitimate sport. It's not just a lead up into Kona. It's 
I think we're going to see it get faster and faster and more exciting. Um, obviously, we're seeing that happen. So, you know, Matt Hansen is one of the fastest guys in the world and racing a 70.3 and coming third, he's, I, I know he always wants to win, but it still can be a good day and he comes third because these guys coming up from ITU are just blowing the doors off and their body type's different. You know, the, for me, it's exciting because the strength and conditioning part of it plays a bigger role for durability, for speed, for, I mean, those two things, you don't even need much beyond that. If you don't, if you're not durable, you're, you're going to be injured if you're trying to go as fast as the guys coming up. Yeah. So you're saying from the shorter to the fat to the sh from the short guys going up to the long distance, they've got that strength. They've got strength from the Olympic basically to to seventy point three. Whereas before we we interviewed, we're in Southern California, so yeah. we're getting the feel that what it used to look like was these guys would go out and they just hammer themselves for like eight hours on the bike, and then everybody would run as hard as they could for an hour or two and see who who would drop. Right. Right. So. I'm getting the impression those days are long, long gone. It's not about... It feels about like that to me, too. Not long and just carry on for 10 hours a day. It's Well, like, and they're specialists, right? Yeah. I mean, we're getting 70.3 specialists, and they can... I think that from a an outcome as a sport, our... I don't know. You know, I think that the goal should always be health. Tim and Rennie and Jeannie and Justin and Eric and Paula and all of these people who are shaping the sport of triathlon, it, their job is to inspire us as age groupers to want to do the sport so that Ironman can continue to build value. You know, it's a big argument and, you know, but we want, we need to be inspired by our pros and we need to learn how to tra train better because that's how they train. So it's, uh, 70.3 is probably from a health perspective, way healthier than an Ironman. Cause it's, an Ironman is not just double. <laughs> no, it's a different energy system, right? I mean, there's totally. and and I think in the seventy point three, we're going to see some of those more of that. Age groupers won't get the experience of racing that the pros get unless we start changing these rolling starts and stuff. And so it's kind of disappointing because I am competitive in my age group, but it's a time trial for me. You know, it's you don't not know who you're. You don't know who you're racing. You have against no idea. Fact, right? So there's no surging that's going to happen. But I know with uh, the pros, they are racing each other. And so in your 70.3, you know, if you try to stay with Andrew Sarkowitz on the bike, you're, you might screw yourself on the run, but he knows that, you know, so he's messing with you. So mm -hmm. we need to become ed more educated to watch these races and really appreciate these races. This weekend at Alcatraz, listening to Cam Dye's interview afterwards, he was like, people love this stuff. Because we can, when we can watch it, if they would give us more access to watch these races, the what's not, and not just the finish line. Let's see what's happening it, within the race and how they're messing with each other. Whether it's surging on uh, the bike or surging in the run to try and take something out of each other, like that's mm -hmm. exciting to me. The ITU package oh that my they God, have is the that. best packaged for 20 bucks. I think it's 20 bucks a year. Ever. <laughs> but Challenge actually had really good coverage this past weekend. You're right. Really good coverage. Yeah, and they were like, you just, you feel like you're there. And, and they're showing coverage of the women. Like, that has been something <laughs> that is, and they brought Michelle Vesterby on to, to do her, uh, the commentating, which is so awesome. She's so personable. Right. That part gets so pushed back, or it has been. Oh, it's And it's like, so bring exciting. it to the front, because they're battling too. Like, it's it's the sport. Like just bring everybody up front. Just show the cover. Just show the cover. We just want to see it. I don't, don't, don't want to see the static I don't, camera. <laughs> Come I don't want to see a camera in T two. Right. I don't want to see that anymore. Exactly. Well, that's why this weekend when I was at Alcatraz, I was live broadcasting. Yeah, we were on watching, Facebook. watching your, your swims. <laughs> yeah. the, out from the swim start. So awesome. I'm gonna do the mm -hmm. I'm gonna do the same thing this weekend and and just pretend I'm on ESPN and we're here live at Boulder, Perfect. Colorado for the Ironman and and uh, and people I I don't know whether they were getting tired of me or not, but I was just like. I want to see this. So, you know, I, I, um, Flora Duffy is, is one of my athletes as well. And, and watching her race when she is in Yokohama or when she's in Hamburg or when she, that's, I stay up late for that. Stuff. Oh, the cover. Oh, my, BJ. I'm like, cause we have, we live in a little studio yeah. with one door and the door goes into the bathroom. So I'm there at two o'clock in the morning with the yeah. computer and the, the headphones floor. on the bathroom floor. <laughs> 
happy. I just love being there in the in that moment. I know I can watch it later, and I will watch it a few hundred times. But I'm I know like it's being there. But now you it. know you yeah, and so Aaron, Aaron. Not you alone. You and Aaron are me. I will. <laughs> this is awesome. Aaron, are you watching this? <laughs> it is. It's so exciting, and that's. I mean. That we're saying how ITU is changing long course, but ITU continually changes. And just last week, was it Monday? I have no idea what day it is, but I think it was this week. We just launched a podcast with Ellie Ab- Abrahamson, and she's 23, and she's a year into the USAT like uh, recruitment developmental yep. athlete program. And you know, just talking to her, so we've we've interviewed these pros and got their backstories and everything. Now we've got a girl who's like living what's going to be her backstory yep. and seeing, you know, okay, it's not going to take me a year, but w- she sees how far she has to go. Yet I ask her what her goal is. And she's like top of WTS in three to four years. Yep. Boom. You know, and that's what it takes. You've got to have that. You've got to have that far off vision. Yep. Oh yeah. This is a good question for you. So I'm sure you see this, right? Like you got to have the far off vision, but you got to do the work that's in front of you right now. Yep. So how, like, you're seeing this with your athletes, right? And maybe, like, I don't know, maybe there's something that, like, a red flag that's starting to show up. How how are you working with athletes to not let this, the far-off vision crumble? I think, you know, it's funny because I was just working with a, a, a young pro today who's been an Olympian, and she's making the transition into the long course stuff, and she's got a little niggle. And I guess that's Australian for yes. a little pain. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and fear sets in so quickly for these young athletes. Like, is this going to be months? Is this going to be weeks? Or is this going to be the end of the season? And they don't know. And, and I don't know. You know, all I, I kind of focus on the positive. Um, so I'm like, well, let's find out what you can do. So we will go through a series and evaluation and it, to them, it feels like a gym session. For me, it's evaluation. And I'm like, well, here's all the good, here's all the upside. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And I think one of the reasons that I've had a long run as a strength coach is I fully respect the scope of my work and my opinion. And I, I don't diagnose injuries um, and I don't give hope where there shouldn't be hope. And I, but I also don't paint a crappy picture if there's not a crappy picture. You know, that's up to the doctors and the physical therapists that are that know way more than I do. So, I think for me, like we talked about the psoas, a, a positive mindset and laughter. Um, I I play a lot of catch with my triathletes. Um, we play football. We play rugby. Um, and I can get them to laugh. And, and I think my personality as a coach, whether it's a strength coach or I used to be a basketball coach. Um, and I used to be an athlete, and I, st- I still am, but I'm, I was a team athlete. And I think that laughter and smiling and helps you relax. And so if yeah. there's niggles, um, I want to get them to move. If you play catch with somebody, it's amazing how they forget about their foot and that it hurts. And so you can kind of re- reprogram niggles with something fun. And I learned that, and I like to give credit where credit's due, is from one of my favorite strength coaches, and Tim and Rennie work with him when they're in Noosa, Australia. His name's Ian O'Dwyer. He's part of um, a group called SOMA, so I'll give them a shout-out. Um, and he does a lot of hands-on work um, with, with his athletes. But he, he believes in play, and play is a big part of what I do with a lot of these very linear athletes. We do a lot of non-linear stuff and it it freaks them out it freaks out their nervous system it freaks out their their bodies um but running backwards and running some patterns and catching a football and playing some frisbee is part of a relaxed fascial system moving in in lots of different ways and reaching up to catch things and you know i I did that not think like they're just going for it they're not thinking about I've got to hit this number. Yep. They're just doing it. I recently discovered, and I was sharing it with BJ, pl- when I was playing with my dog, because he kind of plays with with me when we're out, like, for a little run. He'll do this thing where he slows down, and then I turn around, and he, like, looks like he's going to lay down, and then I, like, charge ahead. Like, I don't know. And so, like, I, I just engage with that now. I'm like, okay, this is my warm-up miles, whatever. I don't Super care. Super like, smart, in my opinion. Yeah. So, yeah, he's, <laughs> So what I realized, what he really loves is when I turn around and I walk or I run backwards. And what, and from playing with him, from having no agenda, what I realized is that that has been amazing for an Achilles 
that sometimes gets a little jammed up on me yes. because I'm getting this full stretch with my ankle heel. mobility. Yeah, ankle mobility. I'm running backwards. <laughs> and, yep. I'm re- and I'm also super mindful about, I'm not freaking out like, oh, I got to put my feet, but I'm mindful about how my feet are going. So I'm really in flow with the way my body is moving. And uh, yeah, I was just saying that to BJ. I'm like, since I've been playing this game with Clark, like my, like, my acute, like my pl- the plantar fascia in that foot, everything feels better. What, one of my favorite stories um, was when I, I was terrified when I met Craig Alexander, and we I laid out a course. And one of the first things I usually do with people, especially triathletes that are that have been doing it a long time, is I lay out a little course of multiplanar running, just run in and out of the cones, and it's usually laterally. So it's, you're going to run laterally in and out of cones. And I had him do that, and he started smiling, and he started laughing. And he was like, I have not done this since I played soccer when I was a kid. And he was a very good soccer player. And so all of a sudden, we tapped into this young Craig Alexander who played soccer. And I think there was some joy that came through. And, yeah, we did some other stuff. But we played a little bit of soccer. We kicked the ball. He, all of a sudden, he's just juggling. And it's like riding a bike, but it's a little bit more fun. So the, I, that was a really great memory for me. I, I hope he remembers it. But I think, he's, I think he's incorporated a lot of that stuff. And I think the, a lot of the stuff that I share in the app that, that Rennie does and that T.O. does, this multiplanar movement, this playful playfulness um, is, is a big part of it's not a secret anymore mm-hmm. <laughs> of what we do. Yeah, the lateral movement because as triathletes and, you know, even as runners, you know, I started, mm-hmm. I'm not training or racing in triathlon anymore. I'm trail running. And I have to tell you that I've had the least amount of problems I've ever had in feet and ankles since I started trail running because I am never on even ground. Yep. I'm never on even ground. And we were running on a trail the other day and it was like at this big slant and I said to BJ I was like I would never have run on this when I was training for triathlon but now I could care less because I'm never on even ground but I feel stronger than I ever have and so I think even just my sport of constantly having me recalibrate and you know be mobile from the terrain has made me stronger we can look at that and put that in the health bud in the health bucket and there's joy there, this fun. I'm like, disco- I'm in discovery. I'm- I can remember being in a half marathon um, in Lake Tahoe. And the road was very canted, as it would be in Lake Tahoe, because they needed to be drainage. And I had to run seven miles on this road, and it was canted. And my feet and my hips were so freaked out. And, all I, and I just kept, remember, I kept trying to run in the middle of the road, but then I was kind of cutting the course because they had cones. And I was like, but my feet hurt and my back hurts and just because it was canted. And I think now that I have evolved and I train differently, like you were describing a little bit more trail running and without risk, you know, just a little more playful mobility with the feet. Everything else can adapt a little bit easier, and my brain doesn't seize up and. Freak yeah, I out. used to be really rigid about that. Like, yeah. on the, I would ha- I would run on one side of the road, and then I would turn around, and I would be like, "Okay, I got to ride on this." And now I'm just I'm all over the place. Go with the flow. Yeah, going with it. Yeah. Um. So I want to wrap this up, but I want to ask a question. So people are listening to this, and they're like, "Oh gosh, where you know I've just I just came from forty sets of ten deadlifts, and I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> You're not doing it wrong. I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> like, where do they, where do they start? Where, what's, a, what's a start for just well, getting, getting a hold of that scaffolding and how, we, how you know, it moves? I, I think that um, I have the app, the EC Fit Boulder app. It's free. And I have lots of free content on the app. And maybe just based on our conversation today, I will put one just for your audience on the app. That would be super and cool. And just some free content. And it's a, it'll be a great way to start. And the other thing too, to remember, because we are performance-based athletes, the stuff that you do in the gym, although it needs to have a lot of variability, it doesn't have to continue to get harder and harder and harder. The stuff that you, you can find four workouts that really work well, it does, it means those four workouts are good. You know, stick with them and rotate through them um, over and over and over again. You could do that for years. 
and and it would and if it's working, you might not need more. So I I have a volume one in season program. I have a volume two. There'll probably be a volume three, but that's going to be good enough. If, if I have people that have been working in volume one for two years and they feel great, they don't and they keep calling me and they're like, Aaron, I think I should do volume two, two. And I'm like, well, there are some cool things about volume two, but if you feel great, don't mess with great. You're, you're doing well. Your coach is getting you stronger and faster, and I'm keeping you healthy. Yeah, it's just the overcomplication. You don't yeah. have to overcomplicate. You Overthink don't it. Just don't have to. Just keep it super simple. And I think that's great for triathletes because they're always yeah. thinking it has there's to more, be. There's, there's more. more. There's more. There isn't. If I, you know, somebody was giving T.O., he posted a picture of himself doing the dumbbell bench press. Like I said, um, and this guy was like, oh, T.O., I brush my teeth with the 35s. Well, T.O. could do way more than 35 if that's what we were training I love for, that guy. you know, <laughs> and I'm like, right. And I'm like, in, in the last I checked, Timothy O'Donnell uh, was coming out of the water with the first group in every single race he's done for the last 10 years. And he gets off the bike and he's been laying there for 112 miles, very comfortably arrow. I think he's strong enough. You know, how strong is strong enough? It's. I love it. It's important. That's awesome. Aaron, thank you so thank much. You, you guys rock. Thank for you for your having time. me. I will see you out there on Sunday. I'm going to be spectating. You know it. And so. I'll be on Facebook Live, Iron Man Boulder. <laughs> yeah, girl. I will too. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Peace. Loved this combo. I hope you guys did too. Leave a comment on the blog post for this episode, a review on Apple Podcast, and share it with your community. Aaron has some serious potent body wisdom to share with the endurance sports world and we are so grateful to have been connected with her if you couldn't tell i loved geeking out on the body i haven't done that in a while on directive from my higher sources i've been a hundred percent mindset training focused with the athletes i work with and i'm just so pumped to have somebody like erin in the endurance world because she is that super cool human that I mentioned earlier, she has added a series of exercises for Yogi Triathlete on the EC Fit Boulder app. So get her app right now and get started on your mobility and stability to support your training and racing. And then after that, head over to yogitriathlete.com forward slash shop and pre-order your YT Trucker hat from Boco Gear, who makes the best hats in the industry. We're about 50% sold out, so make sure you don't miss out. These hats are estimated to ship at the beginning of August. Okay, peeps, that's it. We'll be back next week with an edition of Ask the YTs. It's been a while since BJ and I have come together to take questions and flesh out the endurance scene. So let us know what's happening, body, mind, racing, training, nutrition. What are you curious about? Send us your questions and we'll dive in next week. Until next time, I got a little assignment for you to increase your awareness around your scaffolding. And actually... I'm going to be putting up a Patreon extra this week that will go into way more detail. Okay, but for now, lay down on a hard, flat surface, not your bed, and do a body scan. Slowly, eyes closed. Notice how your body naturally falls from your toe tips to your fingertips to the crown of your head. Every nook and cranny, every roll out and roll in. Then stand up and close your eyes. Do the same thing. Patiently notice your natural posture from bottom to top without trying to fix or adjust anything. Feel your structure from the inside out and get more familiar with your physical vehicle. Body awareness exercises are an incredible way to engage our healing nervous system, gain clarity around the little niggles that show up in our body, and bring more presence to our day because as we know, people, present moment awareness is the essence of peak performance. It is where athletic greatness occurs. <laughs>